regular beans? What? Stop. Welcome to Regular Dudes Watch Stuff. I am your host, Jamie G. Esquire, the fifth, a master of Mulligatawny. 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 I'm here with Soup Deucer and Magna Mills to talk about what we've watched recently and to talk about one of our favorite comedies, Seinfeld. We're doing another classic here, The Soup Nazi from season seven. What is going on, Magna Mills? Did you score or was it... No soup for you. Unfortunately, man, I did not score any soup, and I had to settle for one of those classic New York uh, dirty water hot dogs. Thank you for settling on Regular Dudes Watch Stuff. You can find us wherever you get your pods and on YouTube or on social media at Dudes Watch Stuff. And just like you don't want to forget to get a classic New York food while you're in the city, don't forget the flaps. Follow, like, and please subscribe. Helps us out a ton. Helps people find our show. If you like what you've seen, if you like us, if you had fun, please give us that thumb. Uh, Soup, what's up, man? You been getting your jambalaya on? Jambalaya. You a jambalaya junkie? You look like a jambalaya junkie. That's a, th- That should be a fish song, jambalaya junkie. It should Maybe be. it is. Maybe it might be, actually. Um, I, I know that I haven't been fucking with the jambalaya, but I have been stashing the gumbo. And, uh, you know, I'm down for that. <laughs> Did you rattle along in the cage, dude? Yeah, yeah. Uh, not drinking soup, not eating soup right now. Should be, but I'm not. I'm drinking beer instead. So uh, welcome to Regular Dudes Watch Stuff. We're talking about Seinfeld. Soup Nazi episode. Let's do it. What is bloody good soup? Oh, man. Well, he'll carve up a good piece of wood. Before we go out, for some soup. Let's talk about what we've been filling our holes with recently with some holes in this house. Got some holes in this house. Mills, how deep are your holes for me? Well, I really do appreciate the Drew reference. It's kind of really, really randomly. I did rewatch Rush Hour recently. It's one of those things that was on Max and it's like leaving the thing soon. I'm like, you know what? I haven't seen Rush Hour recently. So I watched the first two Rush Hour movies. Not bad. I, they're fine. There's nothing special. You just it reminds you just how charming uh, both Jackie Chan and Chris Tucker are really. They're both a lot of fun. They're a little bit over the top. They're Brent Ratner movies. Uh, it is what it is. I, I did enjoy them. It's not something I'll probably rewatch again in the near future. Not my favorite Jackie Chan or Chris Tucker, but they're a good combo. If they made Rush Hour 4, I'd probably check it out. Uh, been keeping up with Only Murders in the Building over on Hulu. That's also very good. Uh, hit a little bit of lull after a hot start to the season, but it's picking back up again feeling it and i've seen the first couple episodes of ashoka the new star wars show from disney plus starring rosario dawson as ashoka tana the character from the clone wars and rebels other star wars shows actually very good uh really enjoying this one if you kind of like the star wars stuff especially the old kind of clone wars cartoon everything like that uh you should check it out anybody else been filling your holes recently right on uh remembering the check on the sausage here i was filling my holes with uh, not only what's going on with the uh, with the past couple of nights uh, in in Saratoga there at the spec with uh, with fish and their shows you know there was that um, but uh, I also checked out some of the NFL fucking preseason dude I watched the Bills Bears game you know and uh, it was nice to see some preseason action I haven't haven't really had a chance to watch any or much of it or definitely not a full game so it was nice to be able to watch the full game so. Uh, uh, preseason uh, is over now, and I'm really looking forward to watching full games of real deal NFL here coming up. Were you just watching to see Nathan Peterman play quarterback for the Bears, the former Bill? Is that what you were really most interested in? Don't tell anybody. <laughs> yeah, shout out to Arrington Evans. Uh, I, I remember loving you as a dynasty prospect when you played for the Titans when you were drafted in the third round and maybe one of the best plays of the preseason and it's a touchdown run for that game. If you're watching on YouTube, you'll get to see it. That's the fun part. It's it's the end of the summer, fall is on its way, and to welcome fall in my heart, I decided to go and watch an absolute classic. I'm talking about the 1974 iconic legend, the original Chainsaw Massacre. Okay, just pure iconic slasher film here. It's definitely a low budget uh, movie, and some of the filming conditions, I think, make it feel all the more real. You're just like kind of like really immersed in this world. The set design 
and character design is outstanding. Uh, basic plot synopsis here, you meet a group of teens on their way to their late grandparents house and discover that there have been some grave robbings in the area. Teens stop for gas and decide to explore an abandoned house. Chaos then ensues. That's just like the perfect quintessential plot line for like just like a classic slasher. Uh, I, I think that this really paved the way for a lot of slasher films after this. Practical effects, certain scenes, uh, definitely a great one, man. It's almost spooky season. I wanted to break out and uh, and do a little Leatherface, dude, a little Bubba, a little Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Is it too late to change our name to Chaos Then Ensues? That's would pretty be good, a actually. Great one. That's maybe it's more of a true uh, true crime kind of name, but I like it. Yeah, Chaos Then Ensues. Or good if you maybe if we just did horror, you know, horror movies or something. That'd be good. Yes. Yes. Uh, on that, dude. That's a movie that definitely paved the way for a lot of uh, a lot of others, man. So it's a legendary classic, man. Nice, nice look, dude. I may, I may, I may pitch that this coming up fall. I think it's worthy of a breakdown, uh, but we'll see how it goes. Soup, due to some electricity issues, you missed our discussion of the marine biologist on that episode. Mills and I made it abundantly clear that we were huge Seinfeld fans, huge Jerry, huge, and now. Now it's your turn, buddy. On a scale of one to ten, you then you know one being you've seen a couple episodes, ten being that you have a copy of the Kramer on your wall. How big of a Seinfeld fan are you? Okay, well I don't have a Kramer picture on my wall, but Seinfeld is definitely, as far as I'm concerned, one of the best fucking sitcoms ever. You know, I mean that was one of my favorite shows of all time. Uh, huge fan of Seinfeld man I give it a solid 10 on pretty much every level I remember when these shows were going on and I would be uh I would miss them sometimes on Thursday nights it would come on on Thursday nights and back in the day you had to watch them when they came on so I would have to set my VCR to record them I think I was usually skiing or something on Thursday nights back in the day so I would I would set the VCR to record the Seinfeld episodes so that I could watch them you know either when I got home or or later Anyway, yeah, so I have a collection of random Seinfeld episodes, but that's how much of a Seinfeld fan I was, and uh, still am. Sounds like a 9 to me. You're saying about you're about a 9 out of 10 on the Seinfeld fan scale, it sounds like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Easy 9, an easy 9, probably probably Smooth 9, next, smooth uh, 9. Yeah. A nice smooth 9, yeah. Definitely not a soft 9, nine but a hard 9. A yeah, hard not nine. a 29 on the waist of your jeans, but... A 9 you know. change. 9 is some change, dude. <laughs> All right, well, before we talk about the soup Nazi, we're going to play a little who that, 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 who This is the Seinfeld edition of who that. All right, so here's the deal. Jamie G got to play this last time. You get to play it this time. If you can get three of these six correct, I'm going to give you a half of one of my sponges, dude, a half a sponge for this. Right. And there's no downside for you. Here's the deal. I'm going to give you six actors who guest starred on Seinfeld, and you need to tell me who they played. They're legit guest stars, not somebody who just like appeared in the background, like uh, Pat Oswalt. He was like a random clerk. That's not that. You don't need to know the exact name. You have to at least be able to kind of accurately describe who they are, and it can't be like, oh, she just jaded Jerry or, you know, something like that. So half a sponge if you can get three out of six. First up, we all know Michael Chiklis is Vic Mackey on The Shield and a bunch of other stuff. Who did he play in Seinfeld? Michael Chiklis. I don't know who that is, so I'm gonna. I don't. I, I'm gonna. I don't know. I don't know that one. So, uh, well, anyway, so I guess that's a zero. He was a uh, Steve uh, Pochtello in The Stranded. When Jerry goes, they go out to that party, and George leaves to get late, and they get stuck there with dude. And Jerry's like, "All right, come back for like, any time in New York." And then he comes back and gets like a hooker to Jerry's apartment and leaves without paying her. And then like Jerry has to pay the hooker, and then the cops show up and everything. All right, dude, James Spader. He's been in a okay, ton yeah. of shit, dude. Who is James Spader in Seinfeld? I recognize that name. I don't fucking know. I don't know. Yeah, that's all right. He was Jason Hankey. He was the dude in the 12-step program who wouldn't apologize to George in uh, season nine, episode nine, The Apology. All right, dude, here's the dude I know you know. Glenn Shaddix, due to his Otho in Beetlejuice. Who was he in Seinfeld? I definitely know who that is. I definitely don't know who he was in fucking Seinfeld, man. Damn it. I'm over 3 here. Uh, he was actually uh, Jerry's super. 
back uh, Harold in the apartment, season two, episode five. That's the episode where Jerry accidentally tells Elaine like there's an apartment open in his building and she wants to move in and everything. He's actually right. uh, the dude who owns or runs Jerry's building or whatever. All right, oh. man. Uh, you lost, but we'll do the other three real quick. Uh, Jennifer Coolidge, dude. Stifler's mom from American Pie in the White Lotus. Who did she play in Seinfeld? I know who she is, too, but I don't know who she played in Seinfeld. Damn it. She's Jody, dude, in the, the masseuse. Season 5, episode 9, the chick who Jerry dates who's a masseuse but won't give him a massage. All right, dude, you're going to be mad if you can't get this one, dude. I got to get one. I got to get one. <laughs> Bob Odenkirk. Who did he guest star on Seinfeld as? I don't remember him ever being on Seinfeld, man. <laughs> <laughs> He's Ben, uh, season 8, episode 9, uh, The Abstinence. Like, dude, didn't bang or whatever. Like, all right, dude, last one. Uh, dude, Jeremy Piven, dude. PCU Entourage, Jeremy Piven. You have to kind of be able to remember who he gets started on Seinfeld last. Dude, he's like the, the dude who played George when they were doing the pilot. Like, he was the dude who played George, like, in the pilot within the show when they were doing oh. that with NBC or whatever. Like, he had the glasses on. I can't believe you didn't get that to... one, dude. <laughs> I didn't get any of them. I'm over. Well, yeah, you've been now great into, like, a sixth of Seinfeld fandom now. Damn it. Well, I didn't lose any sponges, at least. No, you didn't lose any. Neither did I. Well, guess what, Magnum Mills? I've got a list. And I've checked it twice, and it's time to find out if you've been naughty or nice. It's time for Fish List. I've got a Fish List. The rules, for those of you watching, are I will give Magna Mills two set lists. One will be an actual fish set list with actual fish songs. The other one will be phony, fake, and made up. Fish or not. Now, Magna Mills will have to choose which one. He doesn't know what's real, what's not. He's got a guess here, and we're going to lay it on the line and juice it up with a half a sponge wager. If he doesn't, if he guesses wrong, Jamie G. Esquire the fifth gets a half a sponge. If he guesses right, Magnum Mills gets half a sponge. Now, absolutely no use of Google or the internet will be used during this exercise. Magnum Mills, are you ready for the fish list? I'm ready for the exercise, not the sexercise. Remember to pronunciate. <laughs> All right. Well, here we go. We've got set one. Set one, we get a quick, fun, uppy opener of Buried Alive. This then takes us into Back on the Train. Gotta love a funky Back on the Train. We then get the new tune that they just kind of been playing this year, Flew Away, which was a good one. Uh, and then they break out a classic, something they don't play regularly, Fly Famous Mockingbird. From there, we go into a very funky foam directly into, and I'm talking about a just a beautiful transition, foam into steam. From there, we get a fun kind of playful contact and we wrap up with a slave to the traffic light. That is set one. Here we go into set two. Set two, we get an absolute legendary opener when they play this, you know it's going to be a hell of a show. We get a Ziggy Stardust directly into an Andy Greenberg. Andy, 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 Andy. Andy Greenberg rages. From there, we get a fun, playful Leopards. They only play that three, four times a year. You guys lucked out. You got a Leopards. Then we get a theme from the top. Always a good one. Kind of space it out a little bit. Uh, and then they slow it. They slow it to a halt here. It's been a little bit of a rager. And we get a God Just Left Chicago. Fun one. Nice page comes out from behind the keyboard. It's a lot of fun when God leaves Chicago. Then we get a very, very, very fast sprinkle. You got to love slowness of God leaves Chicago into the speed of sprinkle. Then we get a combined sky, like a 16-minute combined sky, and we close it out with character one. Just an absolute party rager. Set is complete. Magnum Mills. This is tough. I was trying to, to pull eye reads. I was doing everything I can here. I don't know. Something about the way you said Andy Greenberg made me feel like you were overselling it. So I'm going to say set list one is the real list. And set list one is, in fact, the real list. Oh. Getting too good at this. Maybe he's turned into a fish fan. Uh, he nailed it. 
Um, it's not... I like the, the, the speed of sprinkle. Is that real? <laughs> This, it, it's it's actually sparkling. I'm assuming you're it's using fast, lyrics, yes. and that's kind of about what I've tried to do. Is like I can like all right, like you're just. I'm assuming using fish lyrics as actual song names to try to trip me up. Sometimes, okay. I like foam into steam though. That's that's pretty good. And slave to the traffic light. I like that. That's all. Those those are all, all cool. those are all good ones. Um, and instead of Andy Greenberg, it's something else. But Greenberg is a thing. Magna Mills, congrats! You're stacking up sponges left and right. This is always fun. If you guys out there in the world, we got any fish fans, let us know. Give us one of your set lists, and we will break it down right here, right now. Back to Seinfeld. We will be spoiling all episodes of Seinfeld, anything and everything about Seinfeld. It's in play for our discussion, 100%. Your first and final warning. Mills, buzz us into the building. This is The Soup Nazi, Season 7, Episode 16, the 116th overall episode of Seinfeld. Originally released November 2nd, 1995. Directed by Andy Ackerman, he directed 87 episodes of Seinfeld, including all of Season 7. Written by Spike Furston. Notable guest appearances include Wayne Knight as Newman, Heidi Swedberg as Susan Ross, Alexandra Wentworth as Sheila, Larry Thomas as Jeff Kassam, a.k.a. the Soup Nazi, and Steve Heitner as Kenny Banya. The short plot synopsis is, a soup stand owner obsesses about his customer's ordering procedure, but his soup is so good that people line up and down the block for it anyways. Before we dive into the actual episode, we should probably just go give our overall thoughts here on, on the Soup Nazi. Let's go to our own soup. The uh, the man with the stew here, the soup deucer. What do you think, buddy? What what are your thoughts on the soup Nazi? The soup Nazi is a great fucking episode, man. I mean, there's a lot of really really good Seinfeld episodes. It's up there in the top tier, man. Um, it's got layers. It's got levels, just like any fucking well put together soup does, man. Yeah, I mean, this one's great. And and there's an introduction of a character, the soup Nazi himself. Really really solid episode, man. I would say top tier even in not only does it have, you know, a lot of memorable bits. This is one of the best episodes in terms of everybody gets a great storyline. Jerry's got the soup and the schmoopy. George has kind of the soup and the schmoopy. Elaine has the arm war in the soup. Kramer has kind of like the fact that he's friends with the soup Nazi and the arm war and the arm war being stolen from him. You know, everybody gets something good to do and it comes together in the perfect, satisfying Seinfeld way. And I think that's what makes it such a classic because some of the best Seinfeld episodes, you know, usually maybe somebody gets a little bit of the shaft, so to speak. They don't quite maybe get the best plot line here. I think everybody just beautiful plot lines they come together perfectly and that's what makes it a classic for me jamie g yeah i I would agree and and it's just kind of they figured out a way to kind of get something like the 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 soup nazi and the soup to kind of bring all the characters in on the story i think that's really cool sometimes we see kind of you know they split up and one or two characters are doing this one or two characters are doing that and usually the story comes together but i like that this one common thing kind of find just finds its way involving the big four so um it really works for me it's way up there it's iconic you think seinfeld you can't not think the soup nazi um and that's that's saying something because there's so many things that you think of when you think you think seinfeld because it's that classic of a show but yeah a really good one excited that we did it Perfect. And we're just going to kind of go through it in chronological order, starting with the the sand up bit at the beginning. It's about soup. And then we're in Jerry's apartment. George, Jerry and his new girlfriend, Sheila, are talking about going to see a movie. Jerry and Sheila keep calling each other schmoopy, which annoys the shit out of George. Jerry and George decide to go grab lunch at the new soup place before meeting back at the apartment. Elaine arrives. She's going to go with the guys to get soup before the movie. As they leave, Jerry reminds everybody to stick to the ordering procedure. The guy who runs the place is very temperamental. They call him the Soup Nazi. Dude, pet names, right? I I know everyone has them, and they're fine. They go too far in public with the Schmoopy, right? Like, right away they establish they're stepping over the line with the Schmoopy, right? And it makes me want to fuck up you, dude. It's terrible, and that's the point. I don't mind like pet names like we like the bear, right? I'm the bear. People call each other bear affectionately. It's fine. Or chef. And there's, there's ways to do it. But you're like the schmoopy. It's just like, yeah, you're, it's so syrupy, right? It makes you want to strangle them. It's horrible. 
I wonder how many other names they came up with before Schmoopy, but it's perfect, right? It just sounds annoying. Just the word Schmoopy, right? It sounds like poopy, kind of. It's, it's, yeah, it's, it, it fucking sucks. I mean, <laughs> it's, it was perfect for what it was supposed to be, but it definitely gives you that, oh, this is awful, you know, like, I don't want to see this, you know, who wants to be around these people, man? But soup, you're like I, dude. Have you ever actually been stunned by soup? Stunned by soup? Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, Elaine said, like, you know, Jerry said it, like, he was stunned by the soup. Have you been stunned by soup ever? Yes, I've been stunned by soup. That's why I love making soup. It's, and, uh, you know, so I eat a lot of soup. And, um, yes, definitely been stunned by soup. And if you were ever going to have your own personal fragrance, would it not be called Stunned by Soup? I think that's a fucking great name for a fragrance, man. We need to get our marketing guys on that right now before somebody else takes it. <laughs> <laughs> and, Jamie, you kind of mentioned it. Like, Soup Nazi is one of the biggest kind of it's a thing that non Seinfeld fans recognize as Seinfeld, right? It basically, as much as anything that's not, you know, Kramer, George, Elaine, Jerry. Uh, how about the ordering thing? Have any of y'all ever been somewhere where there is something like this where you have to follow the rules to the specific degree or there's no soup for you? Uh, no, no, I haven't. Um, I, <laughs> I think this is definitely a little bit embellished, but I love it, man. I, I love that shit, dude. I, I actually I want to start being like, you know what? You're going to get dick, no food for you. Yeah. Jamie G, care to comment as someone who's visited Philadelphia and gotten a cheesesteak before? Yeah, it's, it's, you know, I can feel the intensity having experienced something like this. You mess up, man. You go asking for a drink or trying to include something that's not just whiz wit, whiz without, you're in trouble. And uh, you just don't want to get put in that in that position, man. So I definitely I definitely felt this a little bit closer to home for me. And, um, you know, I can understand how you can how you can get up there and you can kind of drop the ball and stumble a little bit, man. It's intimidating. I've been there, you know, I'm from Philadelphia and I've taken people to you. You want to go to Pat's or Gino's or whatever, especially during a time when it's busy. Yes, you need to have your money ready. You have to have cash. You need to know the one window, you're just getting your cheesesteak. You need to know if you want meat generally. If they have chicken, you need to know that. Your cheese, onions, yes or no, fried peppers, that's it. Anything else, condiments are at the condiment bar, and there's a window for drinking fries. If you screw it up and you take a long time, they will tell you to go to the back of the line. And it, it, at one point, it was a big controversy. They put up a, you know, you must speak English a lot, like sign or whatever. And, uh, but yeah, that's a, uh, I have experienced that, man. It was uh, the first couple of times ordering a cheesesteak in, in Philadelphia at a place like that. It was kind of intimidating. I love that, man. That's awesome. <laughs> but you can love it but when you're when you're in the moment man it's easy to kind of drop the ball a little bit here um you know, oh yeah that's, i like the, we see that throughout the episode george practicing right in line practicing just like <laughs> handing the, the, the money over love all of that i thought that was a nice yeah. <laughs> as they walk to the soup spot elaine dismisses jerry's warnings about following the ordering procedure they pass a guy selling an antique armoire, which Elaine falls in love with. She stays behind while Jerry and George proceed to the restaurant. Kenny Banya sees him in line, but Jerry declines to let him cut. Jerry and George place their orders, and it's going well until George points out that he didn't get any bread. This results in George getting his soup taken away and having his money returned. No soup for you. George is forced to leave empty-handed while Jerry receives his soup. We could say this, right? If this place existed now, Soup Nazi would not take card, right? It would still be cash only. Cash only, yes, absolutely. Oh, I, it only takes cash, man. Their line cutting policy. What's your line cutting policy or saving spot policy in line? It can be a thing. You're fish fans. I'm I'm no saves, no cuts, unless you know there's like someone wife went into labor or something. I mean, that's more of a you guys work it out yourself, don't cause any shit, and definitely don't make an island line. <laughs> How about cuts, man? You're not letting somebody cut, right? Nah, I don't think so, man. But I think it's more of a like, you know, if you got, yeah, no, I'm against the it. General courtesy. Just say, I won't cut you. You don't cut me. Right. Yeah, no, definitely. General no courtesy. No cuts. Are you entitled to free bread if you're buying soup? No, I don't. I think if it if it says you get a, you get bread with this soup, then then yeah. But if it doesn't, you don't just get bread automatic, man. I mean, you know. It's got to be advertised. Like, you can't just expect to be given bread. Like, it's got to be advertised. And then if I'm going to get bread, I'm also going to want butter. You know, it's like if you give a mouse a cookie kind of thing. 
and uh, did selling furniture on the sidewalk. Would you buy it? Would you sell it? I, ironically enough, in in big cities, some of the best shit you can find is on the side of the street. It's just a crazy thing. So you know, th- that's where you're going to get as much traction. That's where you're going to you know be able to kind of negotiate deals and people. Yeah, I think I think it's a good place to buy and sell on some of these things, man. You know, the only problem is with big furniture, moving it. Like, how much do you currently rent your couch for? Yeah, I I don't rent my couch. What? <laughs> I mean, I I see it all the time because I live uh, on a on like a resort island where a lot of people own vacation homes and shit. So they get rid of their furniture and shit like that a lot, and replace it and whatnot. So you get some brand new, fresh shit out there sometimes. You know, people are just getting rid of for cheap or fucking nothing sometimes, man. You know, so yeah, you can find some good scores on the side of the road. I do worry about furniture because you don't know what's happened with it, even if it looks good. You know, but uh, did Banya? Hey, uh, y'all Banya fans? Yes or no? No, <laughs> and I wouldn't hang out with He's him. The worst, like him. Jamie, the worst. <laughs> He's the worst, Jamie. The worst. He's the worst. I hate Ken Banya. He's Banya. Ken, he, I mean, look, good character. Glad he's on the show, but he's he's annoying for a reason. And uh, have any amongst us ever gotten the nice face disco? Not me, man. Nah, me neither. Jamie G, you pretty? I mean, you know, I've gotten it a bunch. I may or may not have, you know, said I am an attorney. Greatest legal mind I ever knew. Next, Elaine arrives at her apartment building with the armoire, but she's not allowed to move it in until the next day. Back at Jerry's, George is mad that Jerry won't share his soup. He only gave him a taste. Jerry says that it's George's fault for breaking the rules. George decides to go back and try again. Sheila arrives as George is leaving, and he tells Jerry that eh, he's changed his mind. He and Susan are not going to meet him and Sheila for the movie later. Kramer bursts in and steals one of Jerry's couch cushions. He's going to need it because Elaine asked him to guard the armoire, and he's sleeping outside tonight. Let me just ask you this. What's the bigger ask? Helping a friend move or sleeping on a New York City sidewalk to guard an antique armoire? I don't know. What would you rather do, I guess? Like, what would be easier for you? I think I'd probably rather sleep next to the armoire. Oh, you'd move. I'm sleeping next to the armoire. I'd just sleep in it, dude. Like, right on top of it. They got to take me with it. In the neighborhood, maybe I'd probably I'd probably guard the armoire too. You know? Helping people move sucks, dude. Uh, it does, but York, spending the night. Where you park? Where do you get a truck? Like you're moving things into buildings, not houses. It, yeah, but it doesn't involve an overnight situation either. So that out on the bad. streets, dude. I mean, you don't you don't want to be out there, man. That's a that's a tough experience. Should Jerry have shared a soup at all? He gives him a taste. Is that mean? Is it evil that he just gave him a taste and then it's like no more? Should he not give him a taste? George is eating hard pretzels. Jerry slurping the soup. George is eating hard pretzels. It's kind of rough, right? Yeah, it, it definitely is. I mean, yeah, you think they passed another? They're walking in New York City. They didn't pass anywhere else where he could have gotten something other to you know to eat on the way home. Oh, he totally could have got something else, man. You know. I think giving just a taste of the soup is kind of like enough to piss somebody off, you know. It's like, <laughs> yeah, it's a tease. It's a literal soup tease. Soup right. tease. It uh, just uh, shout out the the writing here that uh, after George leaves, like Sheila turns to Jerry, she's like, "Boy, oh, he's a weird guy, isn't he?" Hey. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> Yuck. Hey, 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 hey. Great. Great. Kramer meets Elaine in front of her building and asks her to get him a bowl of mulligatawny soup. Elaine agrees and heads off, ignoring Kramer's warnings about how to order. She arrives and gets in line where George is also waiting. They both agree that they hate the schmoopy thing that Jared and Sheila are doing. Inside, George is up first and he successfully gets his soup. Elaine is up next and she fails in spectacular fashion, earning her a one-year ban. Jamie G, let me ask you. Does the soup Nazi look like Al Pacino? Hoo-ah! You know what? There is. Could he have been a double for him in a certain role? Maybe. Uh, but yeah, there is. There's definitely some similarities there. I think more heat Al Pacino than uh, scent of a woman Al Pacino, and that oh, dates yeah. this a little bit. Like it's very specific to the time where he did scent of a woman and won the, the Oscar and everything like that. He got a great cup of soup. What do you think was? funnier as far as this scene the interaction george has with them like with the bread and everything he's like oh you see the bread and he's like don't push it little man or elaine in the soup nazi when she's just drumming on the thing and he's kind of looking at her 
Yeah, I'm, what, what was funnier for you? They're both great, but for me, it was Elaine. Just because by that point, you already had the buildup of how serious and strict this guy is. And she's in there just a nonchalant, letting it fly. She doesn't believe in the ridiculousness of the soup Nazi. And so I think for me, you had that tension laid. You can see it building as she's doing her careless stuff. And then it just blew. So for me, it's that, but that's not a dig at, at Georgia scene. Georgia scene was hilarious too. And I do have to say that I can picture, you know, we have our man, the soup deucer over there, like every morning before he walks into the job, he's like, shh, I got to focus. I'm shifting into soup mode. I am sh totally shifting into soup mode. <laughs> Sometimes I make soup. And, you know, you got to love George, too, because George just plays that kind of like beaten down puppy dog really well. And he's done it throughout. You know, it's one of it's one of many versions of George. And it's and it's a pretty good one. And he does it great in this episode. I love how they have to order it to go. Like, where are they standing in there and eating that? Kramer's the only dude who apparently can like eat in everyone else. It's to go. And it's great when they have to step up the way, especially George takes the two steps to the left, like sets the money down and just specifically slot, you know, it's just so just specific yeah. and that makes it hysterical, right? They can't take normal steps over. They, you know, they, they slide like they're doing the high school basketball drills or something like that. And, and George is so, he's scared. The second and time, especially, he's just like, yep, 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 yep. Okay, I just want the soup. I just want the soup. He's trying to follow the steps. He's trying to, yeah, it, it's, it's, and he just, again, the acting here, Jason Alexander just crushes. And uh, I love, I love that. It's not necessarily physical comedy, but it's like the, the structure of like, he just makes you feel his anxiety. And that's awesome. Yeah, I'm, it yeah. seems like really good soup. My guess is he's just putting a little bit of LSD in there and making everybody feel good off it. But, you know, maybe it is really that good. Who knows? Back in front of Elaine's apartment, Kramer is confronted by two men who threaten him and steal the armoire. As they walk down the sidewalk, George shares a taste of his soup with Elaine. It's so good that she has to sit down. Elaine arrives back at her apartment building, where Kramer explains to her that the armoire was stolen by street toughs. To make matters worse, Elaine didn't get Kramer his soup. Back at the soup joint, Sheila kisses Jerry in line, causing the soup Nazi to kick her out. After a slight hesitation, Jerry stays for the soup instead of leaving with Sheila. What do you think, man? The soup or Sheila? Which side are you taking? Soup, soup for sure. Day. Me too. Dude, it's not even a question. Give me the soup over the schmoopy every yeah, day of the yeah. week. Not even a question. And kind of how ridiculous is it that George does exactly to Elaine what Jerry did to him? He just gives her a taste. Just a tease. Yep. <laughs> Love the crack metaphor with the, uh, the soup, basically. This stuff is so good. You just need a taste, and then you're in. <laughs> just shout out, call them the, the, like the dudes who steal the armor, the street toughs. That feels like the outsiders or something, right? Like the street toughs. Like a, like a motorcycle toughs. gang or something like from the 50s or something. <laughs> like Frank Reynolds would have been in the street tops back in his youth. We'll sing for you. Right, boys? You guys sing? Of course we sing. We're a gang. He was part of the street toughs. And he was also in a doo-wop group, but that's what gangs did in the 50s. Back to Jerry's apartment, Elaine remarks that Jerry was right to choose soup over Sheila when Kramer bursts in. He returns Jerry's couch cushion and leaves to go get soup. George comes in and Jerry tells him that he's on the outs with Sheila. George can't hide his happiness and Jerry calls him out on it. As George starts explaining why he and all of her friends are sick of Sheila, Elaine sneaks out the door. Jerry and George argue and George accuses him of breaking their pact. And if you remember, this is from the beginning of the season, right? When they both agree to get married and then Jerry does not while well, George does. So, uh, I don't know, kind of whose side are you on here? They keep the runner going for a long time, and that's really cool, too, because there's not a lot. Like, they didn't have to, but they kept that married bit going, like the pact, for a for a minute. Like, George continued. Like, it'll be, like, weeks and, you know, episode and episode and episode will go by, and then all of a sudden, somewhere it's like George brings it back up again, and it works really well. And, and Soup, this is something I have to point out to you. You know, when Elaine says... So essentially, you chose Soup over a woman. It was a bit. Yeah, you know what I've just realized? 
suddenly, George has become much more normal than you. Really? Soup, why is it that crucial? Like, why is it a bit worth, you know, choosing it over a woman? Well, you know, uh, a biscuit is a little bit more elegant, a little more uh, velvety and smooth and, I guess, classier. But uh, soup, I would take soup over uh, over that situation, too. Or a stew. But a bisque, yeah, definitely a bisque. Gotta love a good bisque. I don't know, like, what was it that tomato? I mean, it wasn't even tomato bisque, right? It was some sort of a crab, more lobster, random bisque. I think it was crab bisque. I think it was crab bisque. Yeah, yeah crab, crab or bisque. lobster bisque or something, yeah. In one bit that's kind of funny but doesn't fit with really the plot at all, it's just the idea that George walks in and realizes that everyone was just talking about him. He's like, we guys just talked? And they yeah. totally were. That's, I think, what kind of made Seinfeld so great and it speak not only the jokes, but just slip in a little thing in like that, which is something that really happens. That's what she said. Yeah, it's just really perfect. I mean, Slipping. everyone slips one passing only, uh, you know, once in a while. And again, just shout out uh, Julia Louise Dreyfus when she sneaks around, when George starts talking and she realizes that he's going to call on her to back him up, the way she just sneaks out the door is absolutely hysterical. Yeah, yeah. He just definitely. creeps right as she knows as soon as he starts talking that he's going to be like, we, you know, we all, and she's like, yeah, I don't want any part of this and just creeps right the fuck out the door. And right at that That's moment, a little Irish accent definitely. without the alcohol. <laughs> right. Now, we go over to the soup Nazis. Kramer is having a conversation with the soup Nazi while Newman buys soup. Kramer tells the soup Nazi about the stolen armoire and the soup Nazi offers to give him an armoire that he has in his basement. And I just kind of want to point this out. It's just a little scene, but did it kind of make you feel a little bit friendlier towards the soup Nazi? Because he seems like a regular person when he's talking to Kramer, right? And it also feels like people maybe get away a, a little bit more when they're getting the soup, you know, of course, until the, you know, one dude that, you know, has the gall to say poor from floor. Yeah, I think it seems a little more of like a humanized character at that point, you know, having a regular discussion other than just, you know. And he gives yeah. Kramer an armoire, like no problem. Like I just have like this antique armoire in my basement. I mean, that's pretty cool. Have you ever, have you ever given somebody an armoire? It's, it's like a, it's got to feel good to give somebody an armoire, but not everybody has an armoire to give. No, they really don't. I don't think I've ever actually owned an armoire. I mean, there are certain levels of furniture where if you buy something to like you buy a new coffee table you don't want to throw your old one out you you know maybe you'd want to initially sell it but in reality you're probably going to throw it away so but i think this is more than that this is something you're saving because it was you know kind of important to you and again elaine loves it she feels it's as good as the other one which is handmade or or whatever so i thought that was great just shout out kramer right how does he know all these people he's that dude right if kramer right now existed in 2023 how many contacts would Kramer have on his phone 2000 oh yeah easy oh, he'd somehow he know them all they'd be all weird names they wouldn't actually be like their name or whatever it would just be like uh you know like a straw guy and you know like oh that's a straw guy Kramer would know yeah Kr Kramer so is a walking Rolodex yeah he, he's got a friend uh Jay Riemann Schneider he eats horse all the time Guy that eats horse gets it from his butcher. I, I don't even know if that's real or not, but I mean, I think yeah, it is. Yeah. So you can yeah, kind of do the same thing. It's like a, a Bavarian cream pie joke, dude. You can just, if you want to make a Bavarian get cream one, pie I joke. Get one of the fucking questions right earlier, and now I remember Jay Riemann Schneider who eats horse. <laughs> that is, that's why you know that's what you loiter for, dude. I mean, that's like that's funny where everyone. There's no way with all those rules, Kramer should be allowed to just hang there and talk to him while he's working, right? Okay. Everything's so specific. And Kramer's like occupying, it's a small place. Like Kramer's yeah. a tall dude. He's taking up a lot of space right by the couch. If anybody stuff. could, uh, yeah, if anybody could kind of like, you know, bend those boundaries a little bit or stretch over him, Kramer would be the guy. Like who else is going to be able to pull that off, you know? And I'd say solid Newman appearance, but he does kind of cap it off at the end, so... Oh, yeah. It, they just really is kind of setting up the button of the episode, which is great. That scene's kind of wrapped up. And next, we're at Monk's at the diner, and we see Jerry and Sheila reconcile. George and Susan come in. They kind of George, join them at their usual table there at the booth. And George decides to give Jerry a taste of his own medicine. And he becomes very publicly affectionate with Susan. Undeterred, 
Jerry starts doing the schmoopy thing with Sheila. This leads to both couples making out somewhat aggressively and again, very publicly. Uh, I mean, this kind of is what it is. I love the expression on the cook's face like when he just kind of looking at it, uh, both the couples making out and everything. In the idea of like when they're going to go to sit down, they, they're asking him to sit down. And Susan's like, yeah. And George is like, no. I, I love that kind of couple thing. A- any thoughts on this? And uh, also, what's your uh, booth sitting policy? If you're just two people, do you sit on opposite sides or do you sit together and leave the empty side? Yeah, I'm going to go ahead and jump right into this one because that's one thing that I fucking hate. It's one of my like peeves or whatever. When people sit on the same fucking side and there's nobody on the other side. It bothers the fuck out of me. It just doesn't make sense, dude. Hey, 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 Well, look, man, if it's a big booth and, you know, you've got you've got something going on, you're trying to get close, there's a time and a place. Uh, if it's a routine, regular meal, you definitely sit, you know, each in your own side uh, and spread out and look somebody eye to eye and have some elbow space. But there is a time and a place to share a booth. That's all I'm saying. That's all I'm saying, Casanova. Yeah, and I would say no making out in a restaurant unless it's like a college diner or something. Oh, or a Waffle House. Over to Lane's apartment, Kramer surprises her with the arm war that he got from the soup Nazi, and she absolutely loves it. I mean, she shoves him into his into her pantry. She's amazed when he tells her that it's from the soup Nazi, and Elaine vows to personally thank him. Back at Monk's, George and Susan are paying their check when she compliments him on being so publicly affectionate. George, he's terrified about what this could mean for him going forward. At the soup Nazis, Elaine thanks him, but the soup Nazi is disgusted. If he had known that the armor was from her, he would have never given it to Kramer. Kind of a backfire on uh, George here, right? Now he's going to be forced to be the schmoopy. Uh, definitely a backfire on George, man. Um, but you would expect something like that to happen in a Seinfeld episode. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of a little surprised that Kramer didn't go to Elaine or whatever when she suggested she was going to go to the soup Nazi and thank him. Kind of shocked that he wasn't like, nah, maybe you shouldn't do that, you know, or try to keep her from doing it. Because if it were me, I would know that that might be a, let's maybe leave that part out, you know? <laughs> yeah, I mean, this is Kramer, though. He doesn't kind of think that far ahead. I, again, love it's always an Elaine character thing where she's like, get out of here, and she shoves somebody. Dude, she shoves Kramer, and she has one of those swinging pantry doors, and he goes right through it, and they stick with it. Uh, I'm sure they did a bunch of takes of it or whatever. It's just, again, uh, you know, Michael Richards, uh, two of the least right for some physical comedy there, and it's just, you know, absolute fucking top tier. I want to say he fell into something soft, though. I'm pretty sure they had a setup where he fell into something Oh, I'm sure they did, but it still looked very so. good. And I just love the little bit when, you know, people are getting in line at the Soup Nazis, right? Like, people are like, what kind of mood is he in? You know, like, it's a big deal, like, trying to figure out, like, oh, you yeah. know, how tough is it going to be to get soup today? You, must, I mean, how good must that soup be? Serious. you got to be able to, you got to be able to back that shit up if you're pulling off shit like that, man. So it's got to be some pretty good fucking soup. I fucking love it, dude. I love the whole soup Nazi fucking uh, thing. You know, I'd be, I would go in there and I think I'd be able to handle it. But it's different if it's game time and you go in, you're like, oh, fuck, what if I fuck up, you know? So a lot of pressure. Around. A lot of pressure. No soup for you if you fuck up. That's what it is. No soup for you. There's a consequence. There's there's accountability and consequences. You mess up. There's a you don't get any soup, and you could get black. You could get no soup for a year, dude. Like he throws out no soup for a year, like it's no like like it's freaking you know nothing. I mean that's a that's a long time to wait for soup, man. Especially when you got the itch. Yeah, I mean that might be the only way you can get LSD in New York at that point. Who knows? On the sidewalk, Kramer and Jerry spot the two men who stole the armor from Kramer. They attempt to confront them, but they end up running away. At Elaine's apartment, Jerry discovers the soup Nazis' recipes in the armoire, and Elaine plots to use them to ruin the soup Nazi, while Jerry begs her, please don't mess with that soup stand. Dude, if you were Elaine, what would you have done here? I mean, she's still got a free armoire. I mean... What, did she need to take it to the next level? She doesn't even try to profit off it, right? She doesn't even think about making money. She just wants to ruin him. That's how like evil the Seinfeld people are. Like, no, no, no. I'm not gonna like try to yeah. like sell this to other restaurants. She's just gonna give it to him. I could drop flyers from a plane above the city. She's willing to spend money on a plane just to drop the recipes. She she's out for blood here, dude. Don't don't cross the lane, man. When she 
She's out for blood. The same chick who, you know, uh, went for forever to get like that free sub with the card or whatever, and she's giving out her fake number. Like, I'm like, welcome yeah. to the end of the earth for certain things, I guess, you know. But this yeah. is a little ridiculous. Like, really? Like, you got the armoire. Like, just sell this, the recipes. And then all of a sudden, there's the soup doesn't exist anymore. I thought the point where everybody would have that good of soup. Maybe it's not just the recipe, right? Maybe it's not just the recipe. I would, would have kind of liked it better if she would have actually dropped the flyers of the recipes from a plane. I think that would have been cool. The one thing I can say, there's been a lot of Seinfeld. If I had to guess, I would say there is not a single scene of Elaine cooking. Maybe she made coffee. Oh, yeah, no. I don't think Might have so. made coffee for Mr. Pitt or something once. That's about it. Elaine don't cook. Mm. I don't know any cooking. Okay. Finally. Jerry encounters George and Susan on the sidewalk and tells them that he and Sheila broke up. He compliments them on their public affection, encourages them to keep it up, much to George's dismay and Susan's delight. At the soup stand, Elaine confronts the soup Nazi with his recipes. She thoroughly enjoys telling him, no more soup for you. Next. I mean, who was kind of right in this one, man? Uh, would you side with Elaine or the Soup Nazi? What do you think, man? Did she take it too far, or did he deserve this? A little bit of column A, a little bit of column B. They yeah, she knew the rules going in, and she was an ass. I mean, dude, he's kind of a dick. He but is. He backed it up, right? Like, he, his soup is actually that good. Elaine was, like, willing to side with Jerry breaking up with his girlfriend for this bisque. If she's willing to admit the soup is that good, she's just salty. She doesn't have any underlying principles. She's just being, a, you know, a dick of her own, basically. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I don't think she cares that much about the soup anyway, man. You know, she cares more about fucking just being vindictive, dude. <laughs> 100%. But, I mean, you have to admit that final bit with Elaine getting to be like, you know, no more soup for you. Next. Then they do the freeze frame. That's a top-tier Seinfeld freeze frame out of the episode joint, too. Well, guys... We've talked about this being a classic episode of Seinfeld, and it appears on most of the top 10 lists. Over on IMDb, the Soup Nazi is rated 9.5 out of 10, tying it with the contest and the opposite as the highest rated episode of Seinfeld. Is this a top three episode for you? It's at least top five. The, the, that would Top three, top five would probably change on the, the day or what I watched most recently. I would say at least top five, but top three is not unreasonable. Top three is rare air. That's There's so many great episodes. So I'm going to probably say somewhere between top five, top seven for me. It's an outstanding episode. It's one of my all-time favorites. There's just so many great episodes. Like people people who aren't familiar with Seinfeld, you got to understand, they, they would do like 20, 22 episodes a season. Like sometimes more. Like th there's a lot of material um, so it's really hard to dig down, you know, uh, Magna Mills, can we reach out to our producer? How many total episodes of Seinfeld are there? So it's hard. It's it, uh, the answer is probably a lot and it's tricky to pin it down. I'm going to say probably at least 200 ish. Let's call it 200 ish, 200 ish. Right. So a lot of great ones in there for me. I'm, I'm more comfortable top seven, but I think you can make a case for top five. Yeah, I'm probably right. I don't, yeah, I mean, I'm kind of with you on it depends on the on the mood i'm in because that could fluctuate a little bit man you know i mean it's hard to pick like you know what's your favorite seinfeld episode of all time how do you pick number one really you know i mean there could be a couple of them that are that are right there i think this one is probably right there um i definitely give it a top five you know when we cover tv episodes we like to come up with alternate titles for the episodes i mean i don't think you can do any better than soup nazi but just for shits and gigs anybody want to suggest anything different just for fun the Schmoopy? Oh, God. No. Don't say it again, please. Uh, the Armoire? I... The Armoire, I think you could do that. The, uh, the We talked about it earlier. The Street Toughs would be would be interesting. I mean, it literally has nothing to, you know, it's not a big part of this, um, but it would have been interesting. You're saying what would yeah. be an alternate title? Yeah. No soup for you, of course. No it soup for you. Fit the, yeah, it wouldn't fit the pattern, but I do like it. Uh, the recipes, I guess. The sidewalk armoire. That would be kind of interesting. The sidewalk armoire. Uh, that would be. There would be. It's just It's just this one. The soup Nazis. Yeah, that's the right one. That's the correct answer. 
They did it right. They they nailed it. Nailed it. Well, that brings us to Six Degrees of Lebowski. This is where we connect our featured review to the Big Lebowski in six degrees or less. Magnum Mills, how tough was this one, man? Well, I decided to challenge myself a little bit here, so I limited myself to guest stars, but it wasn't as difficult as I thought. Here we had uh, Steve Heitner playing Kenny Banya in The Soup Nazi. He played the voice of lesbian number three in an episode of Clerks the Animated Series where Michael McKean played Professor Ram. In Airheads, Michael McKean played Milo Jackson while Steve Buscemi played Brext. And of course, Steve Buscemi is Donnie in The Big Lebowski. Wow. Once again, Donnie. Wow. Nice job working in Clerks there, the animated series. Appreciate that. Uh, let's go around the horn here and give our funniest moment from the Soup Nazi. Soup, what made you laugh the hardest in this episode? Oh, man. You know, I mean, aside from Kramer's physical fucking comedy, I really think the first introduction to when they when they go into the into the uh, into the hot soup joint there, man, like the your first your first scene with the soup Nazi after all this build up, you know, and shit, I think it followed through really well. So hey, a size note. Excuse me, uh, I think you forgot my bread. Bread, two dollars extra. Two dollars, but everyone in front of me got free bread. You want bread? Yes, please. Three dollars! <laughs> what? No soup for you! I, I've, got to, I've got to go with Elaine just up there <laughs> doing her shtick, talking, breaking every... She broke every rule the soup Nazi has. I mean, she broke every rule and i just that i was just dying and just waiting for him to snap it just was absolutely perfect one, one, my favorite moment here for sure you know what does has anyone ever told you look exactly like al pacino you know son of a woman <laughs> very good very good you know something <laughs> no soup for you come back one year I am also going to obviously go with a soup Nazi moment. And it's when he's talking to Kramer and the one guy says, por favor. And the soup Nazi is just like, adios, muchacho. <laughs> I remember that just breaking me the first time I saw it. Every time he says that, I just laugh my ass off. Despacho, por favor. Por favor? <laughs> oh, I'm part Spanish. Adios, muchacho. Well, that brings us to our favorite quotes from the soup Nazi. Mills, you can lead us off on this one. I wanted to make it about soup, but you know what? I'm gonna make it about a guy on the sidewalk. Well, you're just gonna have to hold this for me. I'm a guy on the sidewalk. I don't have a layaway. I just I love the concept that like he's a guy on the sidewalk. He was able to deliver the armoire to her apartment building, but that's as far as he went. And shout out that dude, Ben. Fuck, we're moving furniture upstairs. So, you know, guy on the sidewalk doesn't have to have a layaway. Cash only business. Jamie G, favorite quote. I had a little exchange between George. And there was like. Good afternoon. One large crab bisque to go. Red. Beautiful. You're pushing your luck, little man. Just that little exchange there of dialogue was just, just great and then george immediately sorry thank you you know just just fantastic get the hell out of there before he gets his shit snatched oh because... yeah dude t t get out before you blow it it's it's close to going sideways snoop in this case you do not want to get snatched uh favorite quote uh well i mean it's got to be no soup for you overall quote of the whole fucking episode no soup for you that's definitely the best quote of the fucking episode man nice don't argue with a classic can't argue with that so you think you're sponge worthy? Yes, I think I'm sponge worthy. I think I'm very sponge worthy. You know you're nuts with these sponges. Run down your case for me again. She said I wasn't sponge worthy. Wouldn't waste a sponge on me. Well, we stole sponge worthiness from Seinfeld. So it's only fitting that we see if we can spare some sponges for the soup Nazi. That's a whole lot of S's. Magna Mills, you're up first. Add another S to the pile. Sponge, sponge, sponge. Make it two, baby, because this thing is sponge-worthy. I'm sparing a sponge. Spared sponge. 
Soup dupes. Soup sponge? I totally would, but I don't have any fucking sponges, so uh, no, I can't give it a sponge, dude. Um, I'll loan. I, 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 if I have one more, I can give you on layaway, so you're going to be two in the hole, but it's going to be worth it because I think this needs to be sponge worthy. No, no, he's only one in the hole. He earned a sponge for, for doing the shotgun, so. Oh, yeah, he did. All right, so one in the hole, one in the hole. It's all in the hole, baby. Come on. Carl, that sponge, dude. Right. You know right. this is supposed to be sponge worthy. Because it's fucking, it's got to be soup Nazi. All right, I'll. I'll take a sponge on loan, although I don't like doing loaners. Yeah, we'll just uh, I don't know. I don't know. it's a loaner. Yeah, I'll just oh, want a man. shotgun and a cannonball later. That's all, dude. No biggie. Shotgun and a cannonball. But I will take I will take the sponge on loan for now. I'll figure out the payback later. That's what you have to do to get this soup, dude. Like even if it requires just going home, getting the biggest pot you have, and just filling it up. That's what you need to do here, and that's the epitome of sponge worthiness. Absolutely, you got to do what you got to do. Now that we got the sponges settled, it's time to give a grade to the soup Nazi. Soup deuce. On a scale of one to ten bowls of soup, how many are you giving to this episode? It gets all ten bowls of soup, dude. I mean, this soap, you're not going to want to, you're going to want to eat them all, man. Ten bowls of soup. Good soup, dude. It's really hard to argue that. I was going to split it up and do a half a bowl, but I, I'm, I'm going to give it ten bowls of soup, too. It's, it's that good. I had previously written 10 bowls of soup on the paper, so hear ye, hear ye. I think that officially makes it a top five at the absolute worst uh, episode of Seinfeld for us, but yeah, it's it's basically perfect. I can't really think of what else I would change about it. It's pretty much a flawless episode of Seinfeld. Wow. Well, I love it. I hope we do more episodes right here on Regular Dudes Watch Stuff. Let us know what Seinfeld episode you want us to do. Uh, what's your favorite? And maybe we'll do it right here. On regular dudes watch stuff. We're trying to get to a movie. You better get going. You don't want to miss one second of that movie. Is it that good? <laughs> it's the best goddamn movie I've ever seen in my life. Oh. Dude hangs dumb. I told you. I told you. I don't want to miss you. that. Guys, we need to figure out what we're going to talk about next time. And I got a surprise for you. You're in for a real treat this time. It's going to be a repitch episode. Now, this is something we do every seven episodes. So just like it sounds, each of us repitches a previously unsuccessful pick. Then we vote on the winner. Now, you can't vote for your own pick. And if there's a three-way tie, well, then we spin. We spin the wheel in the sky. Soup Deuce, you will be pitching first, followed by Magna Mills. And I am after that, Jamie G. Esquire the fifth, since we always save the best for last. Mills? Please remind us what soup's options are. The soup deucer can pitch the pilot for Tacoma FD, Wonderland, Kingpin, The Wall, The Last Days of Frankie the Fly, Me, Myself, and Irene, or Four Rooms. Soup deuce, what are you pitching? See, now this is tough, man. This is definitely a tough one. I know that you guys are probably thinking that I'm going to do one thing, but... I'm going with four rooms, man. I'm going to repitch four rooms, dude. For the record, that's exactly what I thought you were going to do. Hey, it's oh, really? exactly what I thought you were going to do. No shit. I, I, I was thought... hoping you were going to pitch Kingpin, to be perfectly honest, but four rooms is good. As was I. I thought you guys would definitely think I was going to pitch Frankie the Fly. So, okay, whatever. Uh, four rooms it is, man. <laughs> four rooms. Well, Mills, you are up next. What do you got to choose from? All right, dude, I can take the original White Man Can't Jump, Commando, Severance, the pilot for Severance, Apple TV show, Happy Gilmore, Tour de Pharmacy, which is an HBO short, the kind of a parody of uh, the uh, Tour de France and all the drugs, and uh, Romancing the Stone. Not going to lie, I was 100% going to do Romancing the Stone, but unfortunately, Bob Barker just passed away recently so i feel kind of obligated to go with happy gilmore maybe the best guest appearance of anybody in sports movie history the price is wrong bitch so uh r.i.p bob barker give me happy gilmore dude jamie g you have a couple options available more than us because you haven't won as much but uh you've been very interesting with your selection so here's what you can choose from inside job the pilot of inside job netflix animated show Pilot of Arcane, another animated show. The Human Centipede, the first one. Heathers, Toy Soldiers, 
The Wrong Missy, Big Trouble in Little China, Escape from L.A., The Last Boy Scout, and Better Off Dead. A lot of options. What are you pitching? Man, a lot of options. I, I just, I have to, when you commit, you commit. And I've pitched this one several times, and it hasn't won. I'm going to continue to pitch it until it wins. So if you want to stop hearing this pitch, just do yourself a favor and vote for it. I'm going the wrong Missy. It's absolutely hilarious. It's a happy uh, Madison production. David Spade at his finest. It's There's so many good characters in here. Humor off the charts. It's way up there. It's underrated. We should absolutely do it. It'll be a ton of fun to talk about. Give me some wrong Missy. Jamie G, what amazes me is I, I've told both of y'all basically if you had just pitched the last Boy Scout and Soup had pitched the uh oh Soup had pitched Kingpin, I had committed to voting for both of them. So you would have forced me to actually explode because I wouldn't have physically been able to fulfill my promises. So I guess thank you for that. And I guess I have to kind of recap the nominees here. Soup pitched four rooms kind of a, a little bit of an anthology based around Tim Roth working as the the bellhop, the, the front desk guy at this hotel, all the directors doing different things, very cool shit. I pitched Happy Gilmore, absolute classic Adam Sandler flick, guest starring the recently departed Bob Barker, not to mention Carl Weathers, uh, Julie Bowen, very, very good. Jamie G continues to be on the wrong Missy. He is going to just bang it until it's the right Missy, apparently. So Jamie G pitches the wrong Missy, and we vote in the reverse order in which we nominate. So I will vote first, followed by the soup producer, and then Jamie G is potentially, once again, the decider. Oh, boy, man. Uh, four rooms. Sorry, Jamie G. Four rooms. Rest in peace, Bob Barker. But I'm gonna, or do I, or do I want to see you bang this wrong Missy until it's the right Missy? I don't know. Fuck, it's a tough call. But I've never seen the wrong Missy, so I'm gonna vote for them. Wow. Well, um, I was. I gotta stay true to my guns. You guys are gonna think it's just the force of spin. You know, maybe it is, maybe it isn't. But I was gonna go Happy Gilmore here. So now we've got to, we've got to go to the wheel in the sky. I'm sorry, guys. We got to go to the wheel in the sky. Okay, please stay tuned for a word from our sponsors while we set up the wheel. We know that times are tough for people right now. It seems like you have to work twice as hard just to keep up these days. Well, it's time to start working smarter, not harder. You need a full stomach and clear mind to handle the challenges of the modern world. That's why you need Beignets by Mitch. I had to level up to Beignets. Not only will Mitch present you with the best beignets you've ever tasted, every beignet comes with Mitch's personal advice. I had that talk with my daughter. And? Guaranteed to guide you through any situation. Kill two birds with one stone. Head down to beignets by Mitch today. My place is the shit. Let's spin this motherfucker and see what happens. Spinning, they spinning, they spinning, they spinning, they spinning, they still spinning. Oh no, Happy Door is not gonna win. Oh, 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 oh shit! Look at that. Farrows. That was, a good one. That was Roth. It's finally happening, Soup. You pitched it Thanks. numerous times. Explain to everybody why why they're gonna be very happy to watch Four Rooms. I mean, Four Rooms is just mad entertaining, dude. It's, it's quirky, it's interesting, it's funny as fuck. Um, it's got a, it, you know, it's got four different directors. Uh, one, it, it's just, it, it's great. And it tops it all up with Tarantino and shit at the end, man. I mean, this is a very entertaining movie. It's something that I think everybody will fucking enjoy, man. Well, there it is. Four Rooms, it's a coming to you. Thank you guys for watching or listening to Regular Dudes Watch Stuff. We greatly appreciate it. We love hanging out with you and doing these. We'd like to do plenty more, so let us know what you'd like to see. This has been Regular Dudes Watch Stuff, and whether you you know drive a green Honda with legs like Jane Fonda, we appreciate you checking us out. Again, find us wherever you get your pods and on YouTube. Find us on social media, at Dudes Watch Stuff. And please, like... Don't forget Jane Fonda and just how absolutely spectacularly hot Jane Fonda was back in the day. Don't forget the flaps. 
follow, like, and please subscribe. Helps everyone find our show, find our channel. We greatly appreciate it. And even though we're not doing Happy Gilmore, we're not doing the wrong Missy, we're going to do four rooms, which is pretty awesome. Jamie G, don't be salty. Remind everyone why they should check us out next time when we do four rooms. Well, thank you again for checking out Regular Dudes Watch Stuff. We'll be back next week to cover four rooms. It's going to be great. It's a fun one to talk about. Pretty excited about it. And yeah, we'll see you guys then. Peace. Hey, look, kids. It's a 50s doo-wop group. What? No, we're not a 50s doo-wop group. Hey, listen, would you sing us a song? We don't sing, guy. Oh, yeah, we do. We'll sing. We'll sing for you. Right, boys? You guys sing? Of course we sing. We're a gang. Boom, 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 boom. Who's on yellow jacket, boys? Buzz, buzz, bum, boom, boom. They don't make a soda pop. Cause they really, 